th this presentation about is about it is it's actually geared more toward people that are first trying to learn about the Green Party. Uh, so maybe for those of you who are newer members or for this is your first meeting, uh, it, it gives you kind of my perspective at least on why I think this is very important. But uh, I just want to say that, that it, once again, that uh, as you listen to the presentation, uh, uh, please feel free to contact me if you would like me to present in your community to organize a community meeting to introduce people to the Green Party and hopefully get more people involved. That's what this is really geared to. For those of you who have been in the party for a while, I guess we can consider it a refresher course, maybe. <clears throat> Something like that. In this presentation, we will identify the greatest problems confronting society today, consider how well we have been dealing with them or not, identify the greatest uh, political obstacles to dealing with them, and make the case that of all the ways that we can spend our limited time on social issues, fighting for change on the electoral front through the Green Party is the most essential. This is so even though, as we shall also see, uh, it is extremely challenging and requires perseverance and a fair degree of tolerance of the extremely annoying habits and faulty reasoning of the majority of the members of our species. <laughs> or as Kermit the Frog says, it is an easy being green. One of the things I hope you take away from this is that finding the policy solutions to our problems is relatively easy. We have those in hand. The question is how to get them enacted in an age in which big money has come to almost thoroughly dominate politics. Now, uh, to begin with, th there's a, oops, hold on. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is the audience participation part. Very simple question, and just take hands. What do you consider to be the most critical problems facing society today? Nancy? The incineration of the planet. <laughs> okay. So you're referring to climate change, Jim? Income equality. Income inequality? Inequality. Okay. That's, right. That's a good one. A uh, warrant? Too many people. Overpopulation? Remote <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joshua? Corruption. Government corruption. Money over politics. Money in politics. Money in politics, okay. Uh, yes, back there. Um, no real democracy. Okay, lack of, lack of democracy. Rita? Corporate personhood. Yes. Personhood, okay. Other hands. Uh, yes, David? I would say it's the financial financialization of every aspect yeah. of our economic life. Ah, uh, that's a good one, yes. Uh, Warren, go ahead. Uh, the inequitable split between the income of the country between labor and capital. Capitalism. Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting more causes than problems, per se, but, but wrong. We'll, we'll allow that. Uh, yes. Abuse of power. Use of power, uh, Bruce? Sustainability within communities, not sustainability in terms of uh, agriculture and, and environment, but also sustainability of the, the community life in the communities, the community aspects. Okay, so lack of sustainability yeah. and, and lack of community. Chuck? I would say lack of transparency in terms of local government, and we're all concerned about what's going on, but nobody really tries to make an effort to see what's going on. So government case. secrecy. Yes, yes. It, you know. uh, yes. Uh, faith in competition and self selfishness. OK. There's a system of. Again, maybe going into causes more, but, but uh, it, it is certainly a problem. Uh, Fina. Intolerance of other peoples, other cultures, other religions, <coughs> other Okay, all right. Uh, one more, Stuart. How about mass incarceration? <laughs> okay, uh, yes, mass incarceration or our criminal justice system and, and how, it, how it reacts. Well, I, uh, I, create, I created my own list, and you know, when you think about these things, as we just saw, you can go on and on with these things. So, first thing I had to do is I had to eliminate some 
Yeah, maybe lesser problems that, that probably don't qualify, like I didn't like the last Star Trek movie. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's up with all the nose rings? Uh, and, and why is it that men's pants, you, you can't get them in size 31 or 33, you can only get them in 32 or 34? It, it, that's clearly something wrong with the world. But after eliminating some things that, that I thought they annoy me but are not real problems, I came up with my own serious list. And uh, now the number 10 is somewhat arbitrary. That's, well, yeah, hopefully you can read the bottom line there. Uh, and I, but I, I, I categorize them. I mean, we can think of others. Actually, you did think of others that are maybe not on this list. But I categorize them uh, in the economic and social category. We mentioned inequality, certainly unemployment and poverty, uh, the attacks on labor. We heard about capital labor divide here. There are subcategories of that, like globalization, free trade, et cetera. Uh, certainly in Illinois, uh, the cuts to retirement security and human services is obviously a prominent uh, issue here. We heard about climate change uh, and, and unsustainable practices, so that would be under number five. So we have a couple that are under environmental. Uh, educational, we, I didn't hear that too much, but I think we probably all agree that attacks on public education at, at all levels, both public and higher education, is a problem. Uh, the permanent warfare state, right? Uh, we're constantly, we've been at war since 2001, uh, constantly. Uh, declared and for all of it, undeclared actually. Uh, and then uh, we did hear a little bit about, about government secrecy, growing executive autocracy, attacks on privacy and civil liberties, the other part of it, the police state tactics. And we certainly heard several people talk about corporate financial domination uh, of politics is, is clearly one. And uh, so I, I put that under a general category of attacks on representative democracy, which we also heard several people say. So I think we're pretty much coming from the same place as far as how we're prioritizing our problems. Uh, bottom line, I have another category, lack of access to health care. We're going to hear more about that this afternoon, corporatized culture, violence, uh, the, our oppressive criminal justice system, somebody mentioned. So I, I think we're on the same page in identifying the problems. Well, now that we've got that uh, a list of the most pressing problems, let's ask ourselves a few basic questions. Um, how long have these been recognized as, as problems? Oh boy. I wonder what happened to the size of the screen here. Well, let's let's ask ourselves. Uh, this may be because uh, we're using uh, what is that office? Open office. Open office. Yeah, maybe it didn't. This should be a, much more on this slide, but that's all right. You remember what the list said, basically. Let's to begin with. How long have these problems been with us? Mass unemployment was diminished for a couple of decades after World War II. But the cycles of boom and bust in our society uh, have left behind higher unemployment levels ever since the 1974-75 depression or, or recession. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm amazed. Not long ago, I heard somebody say, "Well, we got unemployment down to six percent." Today, economists think, you know, that's that's low unemployment. What? You know, it, not, it wasn't that long ago that a six percent unemployment rate was considered a, a depression level. It, it was way, it was very unacceptable uh, it, when, when we first started seeing that again in the, in the mid-70s. Um, you, you go on down the list, the, the attacks on labor, that is, that, have, that is something that has been ongoing. Uh, organized labor in the United States peaked in the 1950s. It, it's it's been, been under attack, retirement security is under attack, most for private and public sector workers. Uh, obviously, Environmental problems uh, have only grown worse uh, since Rachel Carson wrote The Silent Spring in the early 1960s. Overall, there have been improvements here and there, but overall, the environmental situation has only grown worse. You go on down the list, the attacks on public education in this state, we've seen cut after cut after cut since around 2000. Uh, the attacks on higher education, same thing. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago in some states like California, you had basically free higher education. Now it's, it's, it's a, a horrible source of indebtedness um, just, just to try to get uh, higher education. 
militarism and war. That problem has been with us for, for you know, ever since the end of World, World War II. We basically had a permanent warfare state in this country. Same thing, attacks on civil liberties. My point being, of course, that if we ask ourselves a simple question, how long have these been recognized problems? Virtually every single one of them for decades. They, they, they've only gotten worse for the most part. In similar question, how would you rate the government's response to these problems? Well, we kind of just answered that question. The very fact that they have been so prolonged and most of them getting worse for over a period of decades kind of tells you that we can't really give the government high marks on these. As a matter of fact, if we look at uh, problems like uh, number three, the cuts to retirement and human services, uh, the, the, uh, the permanent warfare state, the attacks on higher education and student debt and so on, these are, the government is actually part of the cause of the problems, obviously. These are matters of policy choices that have been made. So I would think that most of us would probably agree we cannot give our current government at all levels very high marks on how they're dealing with these societal problems. Well, let's ask ourselves the, the, the next question. Well, how people organize to resist or put an end to these problems? Well, yes, if you go down each of these categories, and again, uh, problems for the shrinking there, but I'll try to cover what, uh, what's not on, on, the, uh, on the screen here. Uh, yeah, it, as far as the, the economic uh, and social problems, organized labor fights back, anti-poverty organizations fight back, groups like Public Citizen fight back, you have progressive think tanks and lobbies that are, that are fighting back. The environment, uh, uh, against the environmental attacks, there is a, a large environmental movement. I think of Friends of the Earth, Food and Water Watch, Greenpeace, Environment America, 360.org, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, the so-called Big Greens, Sierra Club, etc. Uh, there are a lot of organizations that are fighting against the attacks on our environment. Uh, you, you, you think about um, the attacks on education. Teachers unions are fighting back. Parents organizations are fighting back. Groups like Voices for Illinois Children are fighting back. There's a lot of people that are fighting and trying to resist this. Same thing with the permanent warfare state. Uh, we have a, a, a peace movement that, you know, when the Iraq war started, uh, millions of people out in the streets. There, there, there is still a huge peace movement. It kind of took the wind out of its sails when Obama got elected, but there is still a large peace movement in this country that has fought back. Then you look at the attacks on privacy and civil liberties. Well, you've got the ACLU, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Public Citizen, Common Cause, People for the American Way. A lot of organizations are fighting back against those categories of attacks as well. So it's not as if people aren't fighting back. People have organized to protest and oppose virtually all of these societal problems. But then you've got to ask yourself, how effective have they been? How much progress has been made? There's a lot of pushback, and simply because the corporate media doesn't tend to uh, reported that much doesn't mean that it isn't happening. But here's the rub. When these same movement groups interact with the political system, they mostly fall into three categories. You've got the uninvolved or what you might call agnostic groups. The groups say, oh, we don't get involved you know, in politics at all. We're not political. We're just a movement group. We just try to influence whoever's in office. We don't get involved in elections. Then you get the groups that, uh, and I, I could use the Sierra Club as an example, that uh, basically say, well, we, we're nonpartisan, but we'll send out our questionnaires, and then we'll, we'll evaluate the candidates, but then we'll do what's practical, right? Which generally means supporting the Democratic Party. And then you have the groups that openly support the Democratic Party, organized labor being probably the most prominent example, but there are others. So, you know, we look at our political system, big money, basically buying influence in the, at least the leadership of the Democratic and Republican parties, and then you have so many of these movement groups basically joining them, overwhelmingly the Democratic Party, but, uh, and, and some staying out of it altogether, but, but that's 
basically how they're interacting with the political system today. Well, let's go back to how successful has this strategy, political strategy been? Well, we've kind of already answered that because we already know that the government's response to these problems has been dismal at best, and uh, we know that these are long-lasting problems. So we've kind of already answered that question. This political strategy is not working. It's not working for any of these groups in any of these fights in any, to any appreciable degree. There's little victories here and there. I acknowledge that, but there are few and far between. So the dilemma and what I would call the tragic irony of the current political situation is that you have all these groups that I would say overwhelmingly are where most of the people are at as far as their political ideas, as far as their political agenda. You've got down the list of issues. Most people value their civil liberties. They, they are against executive autocracy. Therefore, most of the people, most of the time, are for peace and against our current involvement in wars. Most people want a clean environment. Most people you know, want higher wages, retirement security, rights of organized labor, fair trade, not free trade. That's where most of the people are at. But the irony is that you know, we keep hearing this from most of these categories of groups. Well, we like the Green Party platform, but the party's too small to get its candidates elected, so we have to do what's practical so we can't support it. So there they go, supporting the same institution, one of the, the same political institutions that is part of the problem, with their money contributing to it, and we're here saying, what the freaking hell? If you just support us, we would be the majority. This is the irony of our situation. This is, this is the political reality of our time. The obvious solution would be for, for them, for all these groups to unite and support their own political party that's behind their own agenda. I mean, if you look at our platform, <coughs> Roughly 80% of our platform are the ideas of these movement groups. They've come up with them, right? We, we, we borrow from them. You know, Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, ACLU, Center for Constitutional Rights, the Peace Movement. You know, we have our, our own ideas, but most of these, most of what we run on are, is the agenda of these same categories of groups that are in the fight back. So the, the question of our time is how do we go from this situation where we're wondering, you know, why are they continuing to do this to get to this situation where they're united behind their own political party and then it's the Democrats and Republicans wondering what the freaking hell is going on and they're the ones that are left out of the picture. So that leads to, uh, just checking my time here, the next question, well, <coughs> Uh, how do we get from here to there? How do we get to that other situation? Is it, uh, do we need a new enlightenment? Do we, is it, do we need better organizing? Do we need better connecting electoral work with, with movement work? Do we need better branding and marketing? An image makeover? Using scantily clad women to attract attention? What is, what is the answer? You know, how do we get from, from point A to point B? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that one. I don't think there is a magic answer. And the reason there isn't a magic answer to that is that we, we cannot, whoops, uh-oh, something happened to this slide. Well, all right, sorry, I apologize about the slide. This is, this is what happens when you don't, uh, <laughs> don't run this in open office first for the first time. But the point of this slide is that we don't have a clear roadmap for what we're trying to do because there's no modern precedent for what we're trying to do. We're trying to do something that basically hasn't been done in this country for 155 years when it was a completely different political train, terrain and the Republican Party was the startup party that became a majoritarian party. Uh, that's the project that we're engaging. So it is important, I think, to put our efforts into historical perspective and not get discouraged by slow or unaided progress. 
I think there is a tendency, this is just my opinion, that from both within and outside the Green Party to assume that if we aren't making rapid progress, we must be doing something wrong. And maybe we are doing something wrong. But we can't assume that based only on lack of a dramatic change in the political landscape to date. We're facing challenges that are unique to this country and this time. And just to, to give a, a few examples of that, this, one, this is one of the ones that drives me crazy, uh, you know, because corporate control has so corrupted government, rendering it less able to serve the public good, more people fall for the rightist propaganda that government itself is the problem, and so what we need to do is have more privatization and smaller government, well then this becomes self-reinforcing. You start, you know, the, the right wing calls it starving the beast or shrinking government to the size where it can be drowned in the bathtub, as uh, what's his name said? Norquist. I'm sorry? Norquist. Norquist, Grover Norquist, yeah. There's a strong component of society that, that believes that, and, and we see it in our current governor getting elected, for example. But it becomes a self-reinforcing cycle. This is this is one of the one of the challenges that we face is how do you break that vicious cycle? When people think government itself is the problem, you're trying to get elected to government to do some good. Uh, and then here's another one. Many of those with the most to gain by getting a good green government and the most to lose under the status quo, by this point, they become too discouraged to vote. And, you know, I, those of us who have been out petitioning, we heard a lot of that, you know. The last let, we all were, we're hearing more and more of that. Well, you know, I don't care about politics. I don't deal with that stuff. Uh, I won't vote. They're all just a bunch of crooks and liars. Uh, you know, people not even knowing who the representative is, not caring, not even knowing if they're registered. We ran into all of that. This is another one of the dilemmas that we have to wrestle with. And then, these are some of my perennial favorites. I'd really like to vote for the Green Party, but they're too small. Or, I'd really like to vote for the Green Party, but I don't want to throw away my vote. Or I'd really like to vote Green Party, but they're too disorganized. Uh, and of course, I don't have on here, all these things were mentioned this morning in the discussion, right? Uh, there's that last refuge of the diehard Democrat, Ralph Nader caused George Bush to win the 2000 election, <laughs> as if things have gotten so much better when the Democrats were in charge. Well, so those are the challenges. Those are some of the, why it is hard to be green. But we do have some things that are, going in our favor. For starters, we're the ones that have the real solutions. We're the ones that, that is take, picking up the movement agenda of the peace movement and the civil rights movement and, and social justice movements and, and organized labor and, and the environmental movement. We're the ones that are actually taking up the call and that gives us the real answers. So that's certainly a big advantage. We're the ones calling for things like a living wage or, or uh, tuition-free higher education. And, what I have up here, this is just a partial list, of course. Our, our platform, as someone observed, is about 40 plus pages long, filled with real solutions, right? There's no shortage of them. A quick brief side note on tuition-free higher education, because sometimes people get caught on that. The average tuition at public colleges and universities today is now over $16,700 a year. Total student debt, Debt recently topped one trillion dollars in this country. Our current policy is geared to creating a generation of debt servants. But listen to this: it would cost about 155 billion dollars a year to provide free public higher education, tuition free, to all U.S. students at current attendance levels. Instead, what our federal government is doing is it lends 114 billion dollars to college students in the current fiscal year, creating future debt, and it gives away over $40 billion a year in tax breaks for higher education, which generally benefits wealthier families while leaving lower income students to incur the larger debts, creating this society of indebted students. So, but clearly, if you look at those numbers, we as a society could afford to provide free higher education to all qualified students, and by eliminating the need for student loans, the federal government would also save billions of dollars by eliminating the current cost of subsidizing and servicing and collecting the loans. So, uh, just some food for thought. Another thing that we do have in our favor is we have elected people to office. And we've already come close in some races to getting a foot in the door in Springfield. 
This is uh, Carbondale City Councilwoman Jessica Bradshaw, Peter Schwartzman, who, of course, uh, you met today. I, I don't know if Peter's still here. Well, I guess maybe yeah. you have a take off. Clean cut in that yeah, he was a little more clean cut in that picture. <laughs> uh, I guess he changed his image a little bit. I think he went to and uh, Steve Alesh, who couldn't be here today, and, and Bruce Samuels, who is here today, uh, are among the people we have elected to office. This is an important point to make to people, you know, particularly when they give us the spoiler argument that we hear all the time. Hey, we've elected people to office. It's the, we're not necessarily going to be spoiling uh, the vote. We, we can be getting people elected. Another thing we have in our favor is on the few issues where the people have made gains, those rare victories that have occurred in the last few decades, we were the ones out in front. I mean, look at marriage equality. That's a picture of Jason West, the mayor of New Paltz, New York. In 2004, Jason West performed the first out gay and lesbian marriages despite being charged with a criminal offense for doing so. And he stated at the time, just wait 10 or 20 years and this will be normal. <laughs> right? Uh, some other things that are being talked about today, criminal justice and prison reform. Right? Even Republicans are starting to talk about it today. Even Bruce Browner is talking about criminal justice reform today. He, he recently convened a, a commission on reforming our sentencing in the state of Illinois. Uh, ending prohibition of cannabis. We've been way out in front of that. Now we've got a couple of states that have gone that way. 23 states, I think it is, have medical marijuana. We can see the tide shifting. Immigration reform, the local foods movement, sustainability in general. Hopefully, we'll, before long, we'll be able to add the LaSalle Street tax to this list. The Greens have been out in front of, of where there, the few places where there has been social progress. We've been ahead of, 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 of the rest of the pack. We are a party based on unifying core principles and values that promote the common good. Unlike the two parties that lack any moral compass or direction beyond following where the corporate money will lead them. We have a party that will stand up for the people's agenda, not the corporate agenda. The Green Party and its candidates refuse all corporate money and influence. It will stand up for government of by and for the people, not government to the highest bidder. And as my friend and Carbondale Green Party member, Sarah Heyer, once put it years ago, most people are already Greens, they just don't know it. That's part of what our task is, is to learn that. Now, this is why I call this talk the fierce urgency of now. And I'll give you a minute to, to read the quote from Martin Luther King from, from 1967. Uh, his... Uh, uh, 1967 address at Riverside Church, that part got cut off, but uh, it's beyond Vietnam uh, a time to break silence. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in our passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words too late now back then and then there's the other quote from the same address about what happens to a nation that continues to spend more money in military defense than on programs of social uplift back then of course it was the Vietnam War and the question was the impact of the war machine on society Today, not only do we still have that urgency, but now, as we noted from the beginning of this presentation, we have a much longer list and an even more urgent crisis to deal with on top of that one. Now, to those who say that we can't afford now to act, on, to act now on climate change because of the economic cost, we can show that this is misguided. The fossil fuel industry has become so capital intensive that it doesn't create jobs at anywhere near the same rate as do investments in clean energy and sustainable transportation. As a matter of fact, according to a study by uh, the Political Economy Research Institute and the Center for American Progress, a $1 million investment in oil and natural gas extraction creates 5.2 jobs, directly and indirectly. A million invested in coal Extraction creates 6.9 jobs, but a million invested in building retrofits creates 16.7 jobs. A million invested in mass transit and freight rail creates 22.3 jobs. 
in smart grid, 12.5 jobs, in wind power, 13.3 jobs, and in solar energy, 13.7 jobs. So to those who say, well, it, it's jobs for the environment, we can't afford to do this. No, we can't afford not to be doing this. We can't afford to not take aggressive action against climate change now. And this, again, I apologize for the, the formatting of the slide, but basically this, what this is telling us is, you know, we're already near, some scientists think we may have already passed the tipping point, and, and it, we're already scheduled for disaster. We're already seeing climate disasters happening now, but uh, certainly if we aren't past that tipping point, we're gonna be uh, there soon, and even if we didn't have the jobs argument, we have to recall this, that there are no jobs on a dead planet. The situation is so dire that those who best understand what is occurring with the climate right now are actually going through the five stages of grief uh, among the people who know the most. And, and we're kind of running behind, so I, I don't want to go through this whole slide, but just to make that point. But the flip side of that is that giving up is not an option. And this is uh, from uh, Daphne Wisham. She's a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. And, and basically, she, she's someone, who, the climate scientist said, you know, I've been through the five stages of grief, and you know what, guess what? We have to take, go to a sixth stage, and it's called doing the work yeah. of what needs to be done to say that we've got to get past this. But giving up is not an option. So we know what the challenges are. We know what our strengths are. We know what the stakes are. I assume everyone in this room does. And we know that, you know, even though things look bleak now, we have no choice but to keep trying. Giving up is not an option. We have ideas. We have the best platform. We don't have any magic answers because exactly what we're trying to do right now hasn't been done before. But we do know one more thing, and that is that we need you. The Green Party cannot succeed without human agents of change to help it become what it needs to become. And this, as a brief aside, this is something that drives me crazy, you know, when you see it on Facebook discussions or whatever. Well, I think the Green Party should be this, or I think it should be doing that, or, uh, you know, the, the Green Party took this wrong standard, should be doing more of this and not more of that. And these are people who don't get involved in the Green Party. You know? You, you know, and, and you think, well, you know, we, we need a third party, but not the Green Party, because they do this wrong and they do that wrong. Well, no, that's not the best way to approach it. We, we, we are the best party. If you think that what we're doing is not right, you need to get involved in it and help it become the party you want to see. Nothing happens without human agents of change. The party is not some abstract entity. It is an association of people. We shouldn't think of the party as it, we have to start thinking of the party, and I think most of you are already doing that, as us. It is the sum of what we collectively do or fail to do. Another world is possible, and together we can start to build it in Illinois. Together we can address the fierce urgency of now, save the biosphere, and save ourselves from senseless privation and suffering. Together, if we all pitch in and become those human agents of change, we can create a brighter future. Thank you.